morning, everyone, or good afternoon, good evening, depending where you are. Uh, welcome to this uh, Central Asia program online seminar at the George Washington University. We are delighted today to have this double book launch celebrating uh, two uh, really fascinating books, one by Daniel Smarky, China's Western Horizon, Beijing and the New Geopolitics of Eurasia, and Tim Winter's latest book, Geopolitical Power, Geocultural, sorry, Power, China's Quest to Revive the Silk Road for the 21st Century. It's a great testament on how many good research is going on on China foreign policy and the global issues of, of Silk Road and especially the relationship to Central Asia, which is dear to us here at the Central Asia uh, program. Let me just say also that this uh, event is co-organized, co-sponsored uh, with the George W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China relations. The, the foundation seeks to advance U.S.-China relations in a way that reflects the ethos, spirit, and values of President uh, George W. Bush, and we are really delighted to do this event uh, jointly. Let me briefly present our uh, speakers today, we will first hear from Daniel Markey. You can see their bios on, on our flyer, so I won't read them entirely. Uh, Daniel is a senior research professor and academic director at SAIS at Johns Hopkins, and he has been publishing extensively on uh, South Asia and on China. We will then hear from Tim Winter, who is an Australian Research Council Professor and Future Fellow at the University of Western Australia and a fellow at the Australian Academy of the Humanities and who has been also publishing several books on, on the Silk Road. And then we are delighted to have a, as a discuss, discussant for today, uh, Roger Baker, who is Senior Vice President for Strategic Analysis for Stratfor and also a Senior Fellow at the George W. Bush Foundation for US-China Relations. And the, the real organizer of this event, that will be also our moderator, is Sebastian Peru, a research professor with us at the Central Asia Program and also a senior fellow uh, at the George W. Bush Foundation. And Sebastian will be uh, uh, running the, the, the Q&A uh, session. Once again, welcome everybody. We are delighted to have you here uh, today and congratulations to our two authors for these really wonderful books that are out now. So let me, without further ado, give the floor to our two speakers for kind of short introduction and then we'll give the floor to Roger for some comments and then Sebastian will be taking over. Thank you and welcome everybody. Daniel, I give you the floor. Great, Marlene, thank you. Uh, and Sebastian and all of the other organizers, I really appreciate this opportunity and I'm looking forward to the conversation with my fellow panelists, uh, Tim, who joins us from very far away and Roger from less far away. Um, but uh, that's the delight of, of this, this format. Um, so I've been asked to, to speak about uh, China's Western horizon and I'll do so in about 15 minutes or so. Um, and I hope not to go much longer than that. What I want to do is I want to lay out in that time uh, the, the main themes of the book. And of course, we'll have an opportunity to, to go uh, into greater depth later. So as I see it, the book has four main aims. Uh, the first of these uh, is to consider China's aims uh, and activities in this region of continental Eurasia which I define in the book as including South Asia, um, that is uh, India, Pakistan, and the rest, Central Asia, where I focus principally on Kazakhstan, but also veer into um, uh, relations with Russia as well, and the Middle East, uh, which includes uh, principally Iran in this book, but I also focus on Saudi Arabia uh, and the rest of that region to a lesser extent. So what are, what are Chinese aims in this region is the first aim. Uh, the second of the book's four aims is to better understand the interests and the agendas, the aspirations of the Eurasian states themselves uh, with respect to China. So to kind of flip things upside down, rather than asking what is China up to, ask what these states are up to. Uh, the third aim uh, is to assess the push and the pull of Chinese influence uh, and these regional aims and see how they add up. And then to take that from the perspective both of the region and also to look at it from the perspective of the United States, of course, sitting in Washington DC, that's how uh, my perspective is shaped. And then finally, the book considers broad strategic options uh, 
for how the United States might respond uh, to, to these factors in continental Eurasia. Now, if I were to put my finger on what I hope to be the book's uh, most important and even original contribution, uh, it really comes with this focus on the uh, issue of how Eurasian states themselves matter, uh, their what we might call agency to this process, the extent to which they are actually driving regional dynamics um, more so even than say China's interests or influence. Um, and not only do uh, are they shaped by China, but how they shape what China uh, is able to do in the region. And uh, in some instances, including in the book, I sometimes describe this uh, by thinking about the region sort of like a coastline uh, with Chinese power and influence as the rushing waters that are coming and greeting that coastline. And uh, with that rising tide of Chinese power, we can imagine that uh, in some instances, the water reach, reaches and hits up against a jagged uh, shore um, and, and uh, is pushed back. Uh, while in other instances, there are more welcoming inlets for Chinese power and influence. Now, this version of things is not entirely correct. And I want to be clear about this uh, because it would be really incomplete to say that Eurasian states set the scene or merely set the scene for Chinese action um, because they are also, as I try to lay out in this book, attempting to turn Chinese power and resources to their own purposes. Um, and even when these purposes may have little or nothing to do with what China itself might like in the region. And this is a really important part of that story. Now, it's a complicated story. Uh, this is an enormous region uh, and a, an extremely diverse region. So I make no attempt in the book uh, to be um, encyclopedic about what I am doing. Instead, and I don't try to show how every state in the region from Nepal and Bangladesh to uh, smaller states in, in the Middle East um, are responding. Instead, I focus on several, uh, what I consider to be core actors in the region. And uh, principally, I focus on Pakistan, on Kazakhstan, and on Iran uh, as the centerpiece of my story. And I do this in part because these are countries that, are, that have importance in and of themselves. Uh, in terms of their, their economic uh, or military or regional uh, power, uh, but also because they are considered important by Beijing or at least relatively important. Second, I try to uh, ask and answer the questions that I pose in this book um, in a relatively systematic way across several cases. So um, I ask two basic questions for each of the three subregions that I consider. The first question is, what's happening on the home front or domestically, internally, within the core case uh, or state that I'm looking at. So what's happening inside of Pakistan, Kazakhstan, and Iran? That's question one. And how, how is that changing because of China's greater involvement in that country? And question number two is, what's happening geopolitically across uh, uh, each of, the, of these subregions? And in particular, what's happening in the existing competitions and dynamics, geopolitical competitions that frame uh, these regions. So in South Asia, I look at the relationship between Pakistan and India, which really dominates that region. In Central Asia, I'm looking at Kazakhstan and uh, its relationship to Russia. And in the Middle East, I'm looking at Iran and its relationship with Saudi Arabia and to a lesser extent, the other uh, Gulf states. So um, bearing in mind uh, time, I wanna quickly step through uh, each of these subregions in turn, starting with South Asia, which really is the area uh, which has kind of occupied most of my thinking and time and research uh, over the past decade or more. And especially Pakistan, which was the subject of my, my previous book. Now, what's happening there over the past, say five to 10 years, is that China is increasingly involved in Pakistan. And the kind of the, the headline uh, of that involvement is the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor announced in 2015, which is basically and frequently uh, described as a, a critically important component of China's broader Belt and Road Initiative or BRI, 
uh, which I'm sure most, if not all of you are familiar with, um, a global agenda, uh, which centers in many ways on uh, uh, infrastructure investment in a variety of areas across a large swath of the world. So the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor or CPEC as it is often described is having, as I, as I explain in the book, a mixed effect on the domestic political economy. So what do I mean by that? I mean that in some ways it's really helping Pakistan and it is serving deep Pakistani economic needs uh, that have been poorly addressed either by its own government or by other external investors. And we can see this in the energy sector, which was the early area where uh, China initially has focused on building power plants um, and trying to address a longstanding challenge uh, of blackouts and brownouts uh, that has harmed Pakistan's industry uh, over many years. So in some areas we see uh, positive uh, consequences of China's greater involvement with CPEC, but in other areas what we see, particularly in the political environment, are countervailing uh, negative consequences. We see the exacerbation uh, of existing uh, political cleavages and particularly ethnic cleavages, provincial cleavages uh, that already exist between often the haves and the have nots, those who stand to benefit from greater Chinese investment and those who stand to benefit less or not at all or even lose. And I open the book with the story of Gwadar Port along the Arabian Sea coast because there is an instance where uh, one might imagine that a new seaport, a deep seaport would help uh, local, uh, locals, local businesses, the local economy. But in fact, because Chinese workers and other Pakistanis are being brought in uh, to build this, many of the locals are simply being displaced and see this as actually having a detrimental consequence for their economic prospects going forward. I also see that by, by and large, China's greater involvement in Pakistan contributes to illiberal tendencies of the state, uh, to the greater power of Pakistan's army, which is already the dominant political force in Pakistan, uh, and the lesser or reduced role of Pakistan's civilian politicians, in part because China is supporting longstanding uh, military efforts at censorship, at political repression, and so on. So that's the domestic political story. At the same time, I look again at the second level of, of issues, which is the geopolitical dynamic and tensions principally between Pakistan and India. And to simplify, again, a very complicated story, there I see that by China's greater involvement in Pakistan, especially its military to military ties, its support of, the Pakistan's, of Pakistan's military financially, but also with arms transfers, a provision of a variety of technologies and so on, including nuclear technology, historically extensive uh, involvement in Pakistan's uh, missile uh, program. What we see is the potential for what you might describe as an emboldened Pakistan, a Pakistan that is greater or more willing to take on risks with respect to its principal rival in the region, that is India, and which India perceives as more threatening. And what we have seen over the past five years or so uh, is quite worrisome in this respect because India's response in this dynamic is to see Pakistan as more threatening, to see Pakistan as having China's backing. And that has led not just to a series of heightened India-Pakistan tensions, uh, which have spilled over in a variety of, of worrisome ways, but also to heightened China-India tensions. And so the net total uh, consequence of China's involvement in the region thus far has been destabilizing, not stabilizing. And we can talk more about that. There have been some recent developments, including a ceasefire and other agreements, but by and large, I see this as a destabilizing consequence. Shifting now to, to Central Asia, here again, a mixed political economy or domestic story in Kazakhstan. Clearly China's involvement uh, in terms of uh, financial investment, particularly during the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, uh, bailed out uh, some of Kazakhstan's elites, leaders, captains of industry, and so on, closely tied to Nazarbayev. It has also created over time new opportunities for investment in infrastructure. I had an opportunity for uh, travel to Kazakhstan to go up to, to Horgos, to the dry port, to see uh, some of the efforts there. 
And there is a, a potential that this could have greater economic development value for Kazakhstan. And yet at the same time, it also, like in Pakistan, has the potential to enrich the already well-off elites uh, and to do relatively little to help the rest of Kazakhstan's population. Moreover, there is, again, somewhat like Pakistan, uh, a mixed public response to China's greater involvement, not least because there is a degree of latent Sinophobia in Kazakhstan. And increasingly, uh, there are concerns about China's treatment of ethnic Uyghurs uh, and Kazakhs uh, inside of China that creates tensions politically. And there is also the potential for a challenging politics in Kazakhstan of succession in which China may find itself embroiled. And so again, on the whole, a mixed political economic story for China's involvement in a place like Kazakhstan. The geopolitical story uh, also has a mixed uh, outcome here, somewhat potentially rosier than what we see in South Asia. But the geopolitics of Central Asia, as I see them, have long been defined mainly by Russia's dominance of the region. And so the key story here to watch is the relative or potential relative erosion of that dominance and the jockeying for leverage of the smaller Central Asian states, the less powerful Asian states, now in the context of a China and Russia involvement in the region. And the question is how China is pursuing these opportunities available to it. And so far, what we've seen is a China willing and able to play the role of the purse, uh, that is the economic supporter for the region, while Russia continues to play the role of the gun or the high politics and security provider in the region. But over time, uh, I believe that we are likely to see a greater Chinese involvement, even in the harder and uh, militarized politics of the region. Its arms sales and influence are likely to outpace and outgrow Russia's in ways that may limit the opportunities for jockeying among Central Asian states to play one Russia against the other China. And Russia itself faces what I describe as competing timelines. Obviously, Russia under Putin has been focused principally on, on the West, on the United States as its principal challenge and threat. And the question is whether its unrelenting hostility toward the West and its difficult relations with the West um, will last long enough uh, or will in fact subside rapidly enough uh, so that it will find itself well-placed to, at some way, in some way, in some relative near term, extract itself from an increasingly junior partnership with Russia, I'm sorry, with China. Or on the other hand, whether it will find uh, that its close growing ties with China as a junior partner will be the dominant story um, of the future of its relations in Central Asia. And again, a lot here has to do with Russia's decisions and Central Asian decisions. And I wanna reinforce this and not always to do with what China itself is attempting to accomplish in the region. And let me wrap up, wrap up with Iran, because here uh, what we see is that China's demand for um, energy, principally oil, but also gas, and its desire to sell manufactured goods have been critically important to Iran's regime. So in terms of the domestic political economy, the regime owes a lot of its ability to stay in power uh, to its ability to sell oil uh, and to continue to have solid relations with China. China has also increasingly provided high-tech tools of political repression to this regime, an ability to control its internet, to enhance its uh, surveillance capabilities. And this, like elsewhere, as I've described, has come at some cost in terms of Iranian public opinion about China. There's a mixed response in Iran, some grumbling and even anger about China's greater involvement in Iran. Geopolitically, going to that second level, China finds itself courted by both Iran and Saudi Arabia, both of them trying to sell uh, energy to China, and both of them also trying to use increasingly Chinese weapons and technologies and investment to prop themselves up against one another and to continue their geopolitical competition. And in the case of Iran, to continue its capacity to push back against American pressure. And overall, China finds itself in an opportunistic spot, again, uh, a happy spot for it, uh, 
but maybe not one it intended, to be able to pick and choose among partners and not have to make difficult choices. So if we wrap all of this up, we see that economically across the region, states are increasingly drawn into a Chinese orbit, um, but that they still will have uh, some questions about whether China's investment is helpful or harmful. Politically, we see China contributing, I think, to an overarching illiberal trend across an already too illiberal region, but this does not necessarily translate into Chinese political domination. And in a military and security sense, we see that China's involvement does not necessarily bring greater stability or peace uh, where it goes. We can imagine a situation where China is more involved in terms of uh, its ability to project military power, but not, does not necessarily bring peace or stability to this wider region uh, and its Western um, horizon. So let me close there uh, and I look forward to the, to the conversation to follow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. A wonderful kind of summary of the key points of your book. Let's now give the floor to Tim for his own presentation. Thanks, Marlene. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Perfect. Good. And, and hopefully, obviously, you can hear me. Um, uh, thanks very much. And thank you both to Sebastian and yourself um, for the invitation to speak to such an esteemed audience. And to follow um, Daniel's fabulous summary of his uh, interesting book, which very much um, complements what I'm going to say. Um, and my, my, my approach to Belt and Road has been a, a sort of complement to the geopolitical and geoeconomic analysis that's dominated a lot of the think tank and academic analysis of Belt and Road in the last few years, which have understood it as a project of connectivities across space, across multiple sectors. But if we start to read uh, BRI as a geocultural project, we can start to make some connections across time but between and, and as well as space. So in terms of time, the temporal connections, it's between the past and the present. And in particular, the co-opting of the past and of culture for strategic purposes, both home and abroad, whether it's in China or other countries in the region. So the book picks up these themes and, and speaks about uh, the use of the past for political, developmental, and diplomatic purposes. It's part of a uh, three book project. Um, so this one came out, Geocultural Power came out in 2019. The Silk Road uh, is published next year, early next year, which builds on chapter two of Geocultural Power, which extends the analysis of, of the Silk Road and a, as a modern concept of internationalist histories, um, both within popular culture, institutional relations, and international affairs. Um, and where that I think that's heading in the future. And then the third book looks across Eurasia more broadly at the ways in which history and invented traditions, invented pasts are being used and being deployed today in the, in the rise of the civilizational state within nationalist populist movements across China, India, Russia, Turkey, and elsewhere. And so this is a project, what I'm trying to do, I guess, is contribute to um, a movement that's moving, an attempt to move us beyond some of these what have become somewhat tired and uh, concepts for understanding the relationship between culture, history, religion, and international affairs. Marlene published a really interesting recent article um, saying that we need to uh, dispense with the clash of civilizations discourse, and I agree with that. But I also think soft power um, doesn't account for the complexities of what's happening today. So I think these 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 publications are an attempt to try and um, move beyond these uh, these these um, prevailing ideas of the relationship between culture and uh, other political dimensions of international affairs today. Now, to give you a sense of what I'm trying to get at in that space, I take you back um, to actually to Israel, uh, sorry, to Palestine in the Middle East in, in the beginning of the 20th century. As you see from this map, this is a, a map of uh, the Ottoman Empire at that time fading. There's a, the Suez Canal, the emergence of railway infrastructure. But what that map doesn't show is also the birth of Zionism at that time. But when we add in these dots, um, you start to see the search for antiquities that was being driven by a number of countries. And through scholarship in the last few years, we've come to understand the role of archaeology, uh, sites and artifacts, um, and as well as manuscripts, in the role of empire building uh, a number of European countries, but also in the Zionist cause for establishing a homeland. So the Palestine, Palestine Exploration Fund that you see there that had links to the British Army and the role of surveying that land which became Palestine and the creation of a nation and forms of nationalism that was spatial, territorial and historically constituted. 
Now, if we roll forward to post to the post World War One era, we see the political landscape of the regions obviously changed. But because this was also the Holy Land, and the history of the region and the narratives that were built around the past also spoke to debates about Western civilization. So uh, Spengler publishes his book, The Decline of the West in 1918 um, on that theme. And subsequent scholarship in later decades of the 20th century understood the, the role of forging of foundational histories that were essential to the creation of nascent ethno-religious nationalisms in this region, but also the imperial nationalisms of Europe at that time so antiquities of the Near East were excavated, studied, and exhibited as the roots of post-Enlightenment Europe. So history also became a key actor in this in theater of imperial struggle. So through works of uh, Said and others and much scholarship since then, we now understand how this, um, the role of history was enmeshed in debates about East and West and imperialist epistemologies of the Orient. Now, this is a body of work that um, it's, it has extended outwards from that region across uh, Southeast and South Asia. And it's a, it's a body of scholarship that now shows us the complex entanglements between geopolitics, between infrastructure, and the forge of, forging of historical narratives in the building of empires and nations. And for reasons, and for various reasons, I think, these connections are not being made so well for interpreting what is happening today and the events of today. So I'm, what I'm suggesting that this is far more than a question of just soft power. And we need to think about how the 19th century can offer us some insights to understanding what's happening and playing out today across these regions. Now, if we look at the Silk Road as a narrative of history, it's a somewhat fascinating and enigmatic narrative of history. So in the book, the geocultural refers to this, uh, what I've called a geocultural, imagine, a geocultural imaginary of a Eurasian past. That is the Silk Road, and it's been built around themes of connectivity, transmission, and dialogue. It's a highly romanticized depiction of 2,000 years of history. It's neither a national history, it's not imperial, neither it, nor is it global. As many of you will be familiar, it was a term uh, invented in the 1870s through Fernand von Richthofen's publication, 1877 book, China. But this didn't mean to say that it entered scholarship at that period. Um, that happens somewhat later. Now, the the Silk Road artifacts, manuscripts, and sites, and archaeological sites that uh, you see um, uh, published that form the body of publication today relate to the collecting of antiquities that happened at the uh, end of the 19th century, both within Europe, uh, Russia, and in Japan. So the Silk Road in Japan takes on a pan Asianist uh, movement to it, momentum to it through the 20th century. And of course, this was playing out in the great game um, of that period through Central Asia. And uh, so in that map, I would suggest there's some parallels to what we're seeing play out today. So this is part of the themes that I trace in the book um, and the very different political environments of that period that allow this transcontinental, transcultural history to emerge rather than something in the Middle East or in the South Asia during that period. <clears throat> However, the Silk Road doesn't enter public consciousness, consciousness in Europe until the 1930s, as you see from this graph. Um, and through the Cold War, it's only really picked up in Japan and it starts its pathway towards global fame during the 1980s. And that's primarily because of the end of the Cold War and a new language of East and West that was required. So in 1988, UNESCO launches a Silk Roads Roads in Dialogue project, which ends up lasting around a decade, which involves multiple conferences, publications, uh, workshops, scholarly reports, so on and so forth, but also a number of expeditions, both overland and, and maritime. So the Maritime Silk Road voyage happens in 1991. So what you can see from this map is that the Silk Road has dramatically expanded from uh, Ron Richthofen's depiction of uh, silk trade between Han Dynasty uh, China and the Roman Empire and the two centuries either side, the birth, either, either side of the birth of Christ. So this is also the moment where we see the Maritime Silk Road uh, enter international uh, cultural policy. And here's a, an event many of you in Washington might be familiar with. This dates back to 2002, where the Silk Road becomes a, a part of the Smithsonian uh, Institute's uh, summer festival um, on the Washington Mall in the, in the wake of 9-11. So what we see in the 1990s and early 2000s is a Silk Road emerge um, with, a, with a number of values and ideals that are attached to it. This is what I'm summarizing here. It, come, it becomes a history of internationalism and associated with ideas and the themes of cross-cultural dialogue, peace and international cooperation, 
the dialogue between civilizations. It's a narrative of cosmopolitanism, cosmopolitanism and the cosmopolitan travelers such as Ivan Batuta, Marco Polo, and a number of travelers in, Ch in China. It's also a story of East and West in dialogue and a peaceful interpolitary relations. And for this reason, it, it ends up being picked up during this um, late 20th century period by a whole series of, series of institutions and publishers. It becomes a genre of uh, sort of coffee table publishing. And of course, as many of you will be familiar with, it also becomes a term for foreign policy for a number of countries in Central Asia, East Asia, as well as the United States. And it's all these different themes, these ideas and these narratives of the Silk Road that come together in the Belt and Road Initiative, both in terms of future making, ideas of foreign policy, infrastructure, connectivities, but also this um, depiction of a Eurasia that's um, steeped in a deep history of benign connectivity and, and friendship and tolerance and trust and harmonious relations. So what I've argued in the book is this narrative of the Silk Road is doing a lot of uh, political work in terms of China itself. We've seen a whole series of cultural infrastructures being built across the country that are celebrating the great pasts of the country. And the Silk Road stands front and center in this today, such as in cities in Xi'an. And I would suggest there's some interesting parallels there that we might draw with 19th century Europe and the role of public architecture and the grand museums of that period, which were very much civic projects and in the, in the construction and the citizens of empire. These were being built to legitimize the ambitions of the states in that region at that time and forging narratives of power for the imperial nation. So that raises interesting questions of how we read what is happening in China around this use of history and heritage as a national project. It's been an extraordinary project of 4,000 or more museums built in the last seven years and massive investments in new cultural infrastructure and the preserving of cultural heritage across the country. And the Silk Road advances certain ideas and themes about Chinese histories within this, that the country is successful when it's open, that it's confident in, its, in dialogue with others, and that prosperity comes from open borders. But I, what I also show in the book is that the Silk Road serves as a, uh, as a platform of shared values for building alliances across the region. And that's also um, somewhat parallel today in the Indo-Pacific as a values-based uh, discourse of cooperation and the quad that we've seen emerge in the, in the last few years. But with Belt and Road, we're seeing this because of the global fame and the popularity of the Silk Road and its benign circulation in popular culture and in, in, and in the space of international cooperation. The Silk Road is being picked up by a whole series of actors, state and non-state, um, across a whole series of co uh, uh, countries. And that's a picture from, uh, or a slide from the website, uh, silkroadfutures.net, that kind of traces some of these institutional connections that's been forged in the last few years. It's also become a platform for uh, cultural sector aid and cooperation. So I take you back to the domain of archeology. span And but this time I'll give you a few examples from the Maritime Silk Road. So that what we're seeing is a search for the histories of connectivity as a basis for friendship claims that stretch back centuries. So it's suggesting that Sri Lanka and China in this case were friendships on the Maritime Silk Road. And you might ask when was the Maritime Silk Road is a post Cold War invention or does it stretch back 600 or 700 years as certain scholars are arguing today and rewriting this history in certain ways and, and depoliticizing these histories and removing episodes of invasion, conflict and bloodshed for benign histories of friendship and, and connectivity. But of course today this this sector speaks to more than just archaeology. It's becoming a cooperation platform across multiple sectors. So here are examples from Malaysia, where uh, the Maritime Silk Road uh, history and narrative is being used as a, a vehicle for all sorts of forms of development, primarily around tourism and investments around making uh, cities attractive for um, uh, different forms of population that might be migrating to those regions in Southeast Asia. Um, and then when we step back uh, further, we see that this is happening on extra, quite an extraordinary scale. So, so what I think is particularly interesting is the ways in which Asia is moving towards its maritime history. And in the last two days, the Indian Council for International Affairs, World Affairs, sorry, has just run a two day workshop on developing a maritime consciousness in India today. So this is a, a language that's being picked up across a number of countries in the region. But to come back to the uh, Eurasian continent, what we see here are the 500 or so sites that are being recommended by a number of organizations, primarily those associated with UNESCO, 
for Silk Road uh, World Heritage nominations. So World Heritage, as I'm sure and many, many of you aware, has become a kind of the cultural Olympics um, or in recent decades, where uh, a, a huge banner of prestige that countries are vying for to be um, going up the league tables of the number of properties, both cultural and natural sites um, within their regions. But what we've seen in the last few years is how this maps onto the uh, developmental corridors of Belt and Road, um, as you see in this slide, and what that means for these uh, these regions and the communities living across this uh, this developmental geography. So, in case of Central Asia, I think the real game changer, the long term game changer, will be the um, uh, uptake in passenger trains, as well as the uh, the uh, airports that are opening across the region. Um, on based on the anticipated growth in tourism infrastructures. And what we see in this slide is the convergence between these cultural uh, sites and the tourism uh, infrastructures of both airports and rail networks um, that's, uh, as I say, coming online and I think will continue. Um, and if you look to other regions, whether it's Southeast Asia, there's a, some particular trends that you could certainly identify there. But because the Silk Road is now being picked up, that's uh, as, a, as a discourse of connectivity within Belt and Road, the stretches right across to the Mediterranean. We're also seeing um, this happening in, in uh, countries such as Turkey, Italy, and Greece, um, with a number of universities, for example, in Greece, rewriting uh, Greek history to, to, so that Greek is now part of the Silk Road story and connects to China um, for touristic purposes. So the real big issue here, of course, is the growth in Chinese tourism. And pre-COVID levels were up around 140 to 145 million Chinese tourists coming out each year. And the Silk Road is becoming a platform for that outbound tourism market. And I would again suggest there's interesting parallels to European tourism of the 19th century, which very much followed the geographies of empire during that period. But of course, what we've got today are the digital infrastructures of these industries the payments systems, the international financial structures, the app economies. And I would suggest that these constitute a new form of digital power, suggesting with the number of think tanks uh, from China, suggesting to these smaller countries in the Mediterranean and Central Asia, that you're invisible if you're not on these uh, uh, Chinese driven uh, ecosystems of, of tourism and, and connectivity. But I would take you back to this map for my final point which is um, back to that map of these World Heritage Sites, because this is rapidly emerging again as a platform and a mechanism for transboundary collaborations between various state and non-state actors. And I think, again, we might look at this in the context of uh, surveying, in, in the context of the 19th century. And today, within the Silk Road research and policy, these digital tools are, are, have their own political and social uh, lives to them. And I would suggest that they afford geocultural epistemologies in the way that cartographies of previous eras haven't. Um, they also serve as instruments of governance for minority regions or minority border areas. Um, so I think this raises really important questions of what's happening across uh, Central Asia and uh, within China itself today. And just finally to wrap up, I would say that part of one of the themes I've really covered in the book and tried to argue is that the Silk Road operates as an ideational concept and as well as an ideological uh, idea. So the Silk Road history and heritage as it's being mobilized becomes a way, a mode of knowing Eurasia across land and across sea. It makes Eurasia familiar for the public, for intellectuals for, and for institutions within an outward looking internationally ambitious, ambitious China, as well as for a number of countries across the regions. So the Silk Road, as a geocultural imaginary of Eurasia's past, becomes also a space of knowledge production across all sorts of institutions. It naturalizes certain ideas about the past in the projection of futures and the construction of imagined communities in those futures, and around ideas of connectivity, cooperation, and that the opening of borders now works as, an, as a platform of depoliticized cooperation. And in that respect, I will leave it there and hand back to um, Sebastian. And thank you so much, uh, team, for that presentation. Really fascinating. It's so great to see how the two books are also replying to, to each other. So I now would like to invite our discussant, uh, Roger, to comment on both books, and then Sebastian will take over for the Q&A after that. Thank you, Roger. The floor is yours. Thank you. So, so as, as Tim mentioned, um, these books are very complementary in their approach, uh, uh, in the way in which you can look at them and interact with them. Um, we have uh, Daniel's book, 
that focuses very much on the on the physical and the concrete, um, on the on the concepts of of uh, what is real in the space, right? Rather than what does China want to do, and China will just accomplish everything it wants to achieve. You have to understand the playing field, uh, you know, as uh, W. Gordon East talked about it. You know, the wicket and cricket. You, you've got to know where they're playing and how that's going to be able to to shape what happens. Um, and it, and it's often, I think, particularly from a U.S. perspective or from an outside perspective, uh, there's frequently a failure to recognize that the local actors are are active. They're not merely responsive. Um, so I think that that's an important piece. Uh, Tim brings out uh, this concept of the reinterpretation of history, um, the way that one can utilize history as a way to uh, justify um, the, uh, current patterns and current desires, uh, as a way to try to tamp down some of the um, realities that, that Daniel's book brings out. Um, and, and one of the things that both of these books really highlights to me, uh, when you look at them together and look at some of the other uh, literature and really observe what's going on, is that China is not unique in the sense that China is not some new entity that only operates in a win-win world and everything China wishes to do, they do, and they think in 100-year plans, and they have these... these you know, perfect blocks of future planning, and they're the super strategic thinkers, and the rest of the world um, are are embarrassed by that and, and are the ones left behind. But instead, what we see is a China that faces, as China reaches a certain point of economic power, of demographic power, and ultimately now of political and military power, that it pushes against reality all around it. How it manages that reality is perhaps a choice of the way in which China wishes to pursue it, right? Some of this is in this interpretation of history. But I would argue that if you think about some of the references that, that have been made even in this discussion, um, the West interpreted history in its own unique ways as well to, to be able to shape its ideas and its designs. You can look at the history of the United States and these ideas of the, the, the slow movement of enlightenment from east to west, and then the ultimate role of the United States to push further west and push enlightenment back to the east again to where it begins. So those reshapings of, of the historical concepts, the, the framing concepts of, of ideology and things of that sort. Um, really important from a, I, I come at this from a geopolitical perspective, from a classical geopolitical perspective. So the, the first thing that comes into one's mind when they look at Belt and Road is Mackinder's nightmare, right? This is the, this is the connectivity that, that Mackinder said technology would allow that would not only unify Eurasia, um, but would unify the world island, right? One, one of the things we don't get in, in this discussion because we're focused mostly on the Eurasia is the further extents. We hint a little bit at it, right? Out into Europe down into Africa, right? The whole Indian Ocean Basin and combining that area of, of, of human resources, um, natural resources, productive capacity and building a transportation infrastructure that pulls it, ties it together. Um, this also gets you into the way in which the United States maybe engages with this. Um, Dan's book talks a little bit about this but one of the challenges for the United States is if the United States is traditionally a maritime power that may be worried about a Eurasian heartland power being able to dominate that space, distance um, and limited connectivity for the United States. The, the worst places for the United States to try to lock itself in is in the middle of Central Asia, right? It, it works best along, as Spikeman called it, the rimland along that, that area of contact between the maritime space and between the continental space. And in, in some of this, we see that. You see that the complications in South Asia, in the Middle East. We didn't talk much about um, uh, Southeast Asia and the maritime space in this discussion. That's perhaps the, um, the part that's um, discussed the most in common parlance because it's the place where people can perceive a maritime United States clearly being pushed by an expansionary China, wherein in, in the, the general perception of 
of the general public in America or, in, or even in some sense in Europe, Central Asia is just far away. It's, it's someplace in the middle and it's someplace you don't see. I think the Russian component here is really important as well. The idea of does Russia allow itself ultimately to be a junior partner? Or do we see a cyclical pattern of Russia where when it, feel, when it gets pushed back and back and consolidates and consolidates, it pushes back out. It looks back at the Tianxin Mountains and it looks back at these areas of saying, how do you, how do you need to reassert itself? Um, the Arctic isn't, isn't included in this discussion and that's a new space that creates both opportunity and challenges for um, Russia in its relationship to China. Um, and we see the Russians reaching out to the Japanese and the Koreans. Um, in the concept of the Silk Road, I think one of the key points that was brought up was the idea that as, Ru as China re re-envisions the Silk Road in its own interpretation, and I like the, 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 what Tim brought up on how the initial interpretation of the Silk Road really comes out of European imperial competition. A a and then we move to a period of uh, post-Cold War. So in that idea of the world is fallat globalization, it's completely reinterpreted into the present. And as a historian also, I will tell you, history is a reflection of the present more than it's a reflection of the past, right? And so those interpretations really hit us at, at the present. Um, that Russia question goes to an element for the United States as we look forward. Is the answer a, a, a reverse Kissinger or reverse Nixon, right? Is it the idea that ultimately the, the risk of China is something that is going to be perceived common to Russia, to elements of Europe, to elements of the United States that creates that space? Or does current ideology continue to block and prevent that type of evolution? And a final piece I think that, that, that isn't necessarily brought up in here, but is an interesting complication um, is rail gauge. We, we, we talk about connectivity um, and the flow of, of both people and ideas, and even in the ideas, the flow of tourism and things of that sort through the region. One of the places where Russia has managed to maintain a, a concrete strength in Central Asia has clearly been in dissuading the Central Asians from allowing China to shift to standard gauge through Central Asia. So you still have that bit of complication left over from eras before. Uh, 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 I, would, I would suggest there's a really interesting third book that could be read in connection with these two. And that's um, Jacob Greigel's book on great powers and geopolitical change. And, and Greigel looks at geopolitics in that book from the lens of resources and roots, which in many ways is, the, is um, both physically and conceptually the way that, that the Silk Road area is looked at. And he looks at, at three old ancient empires, right? Um, the, the Venetians, the Ottomans, and Ming China. And he looks at how changes in technology, changes in roots and resources Im have a significant impact on uh, the geostrategic space within which these great powers operate. And then their decision-making on how they adapt and adjust to those changes determines their effectiveness or their ineffectiveness. And as we look at the future of how some of these countries around the periphery or how the United States is going to manage um, this in the future, it's an interesting book to put in parallel with the three that we have here. If I can use my prerogative and throw two questions out to our, to our um, uh, authors uh, before I hand it over to Sebastian, um, uh, the two that, I, that, that I'd like to bring up, um, and, and both of you can throw in answers as, as you see fit. One is in the, the complication of Xinjiang um, for China. Uh, as China tries to both tie in civilizational connecting narratives with Islam and Zhenghei and, and those connections, it's simultaneously trying to isolate uh, Xinjiang from that, similar to what we've seen in Inner Mongolia and now trying to block in, uh, Mongolian language, what we've seen in other parts around the periphery. So China has a, 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 a almost competing set of narratives, an internal set of narratives about the cohesiveness of the Chinese geography and an external and somewhat internal set of narratives about the connectivity and civilizational connections of China across regions. 
So that would be one on thinking about how that evolves and, and how China continues to manage, for example, the Middle East, the Central Asians, uh, Turkey, in, in their view and, and ideas of pan-Turkic uh, elements. And the other, the other piece or the other complementary question um, for, for me here would be to think about, um, you know, uh, is Central Asia a bridge too far for the United States? And is it in fact, is it potentially a place where, quite frankly, as, as uh, an area of the world that has in the past been called the graveyard of empires, um, is it a place where if the United States doesn't necessarily actively intervene, that as China gets pulled further and further in, it finds itself forced to alter the way in which it interacts um, with other countries in the region. It finds itself pulled in the same direction of past powers and having to exert defensive security and military forces. And thus that breaks the Chinese narrative of China as a unique and distinct win-win non-interfering power on the world system. And I think I'll, I'll leave it with those two kind of broad thoughts or ideas for y'all uh, right there. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you so, so much, uh, Daniel, uh, Tim, for this great presentations, and thank you, Roger, for this, uh, for this very rich, I mean, excellent comments. Uh, one of the uh, fascinating points really addressed by the authors in their books, I mean, by Tim and Daniel, is really the wide uh, geographical and temporal scope uh, they address in their books, which, of course, raise uh, plenty of questions. Maybe before asking the, the questions, I'll give some time to uh, to Daniel and team to answer Roger's uh, Roger's questions and comments. Daniel or team, up to you. Sure. Um, no, I can I can jump in, uh, and then I'm curious to hear Tim's response as well. Um, first, let me thank uh, both of the other panelists uh, for really great presentations and, and observations. I will uh, say that, that uh, Roger mentioned uh, Jakob Griel's book. Jakob and I were grad school friends, uh, and um, and I cite his book in mine, so um, so I can I can agree with that as well. Uh, let me just pick up on on Xinjiang uh, to begin with. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of interesting ways you can frame Xinjiang as a competing problem of narratives for China, and that's how you approached it. Um, as, you, as you pointed out, most of my work is really having more to do with the, the practical questions of how do you get from one place to another? Uh, what do you do once you're there? Uh, what types of things can you build? Uh, what types of military and security uh, relations can, can evolve and emerge from that? And there, I would say Xinjiang has been clearly a complicating factor in China's relations with the wider region. And given the way that it is turned to an incredibly repressive, uh, even genocidal approach to managing the problem of, as it sees it, the problem of Xinjiang, driven I think by a, a wrongheaded uh, sense of how to dominate and control populations within China. I think this is creating not just a momentary black eye in China's relations with the West, but a long-term uh, challenge for China's management of its relations with its neighbors, uh, its Muslim neighbors principally, uh, where it will become increasingly difficult, I believe, for these countries, even their elites who have every reason and have demonstrated every reason to overlook China's behavior in Xinjiang. Um, as this persists, uh, this will be harder for them to overlook, to discount, to, to redirect, their publics and populations are increasingly aware of what's actually going on. And, and I think that will come at a cost. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but I, I think that's likely to emerge. And then just quickly on the, is Central Asia a bridge too far for the United States, a graveyard for empires that will um, treat China the same way as it's treated other great empires in history? The short answer would be uh, probably to some extent, yes. That is, the United States needs to be cognizant of the limits of its own geopolitical power. And increasingly, I think we are. We recognize that a war in Afghanistan is a costly enterprise that can go on and on and on and, and really suck us dry um, in so many different ways with an inconclusive consequence and outcome that we wouldn't like to, to repeat. And we're unlikely to repeat in the ways that we've done over the, over the past couple of decades. 
Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that China, um, as it extends its influence, uh, will repeat all of the same behaviors as we have. So one of the points that I tend to make is we're already seeing the extension of China's uh, security foot, its military boot uh, across pieces of this territory, a new base in Djibouti, security forces in Tajikistan, and so on. And we are almost certain to see more of this. But China, more like Russia, doesn't seem to have quite the same sense that it needs to uh, pacify and bring about um, a degree of governance, much less democratic governance, to, the, to these countries in the region. And maybe unencumbered by those ambitions, China can, uh, in a sense, project its military uh, power across a wider swath of territory up to Europe's doorstep without necessarily either pacifying or even attempt, attempting to seriously pacify. It can extract resources, gain access, extend its reach, um, but without necessarily bringing those benefits uh, of uh, economic development or, or political uh, and governance reform that we might have held as an ambition. So that's a different way of seeing the region um, that I think is, in my view, more consistent with what we're likely to see out of China. Thanks again. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Tim, do you want to answer? Sure. Yeah, th thank you for that. Um, I'm going to speak to a couple of Roger's comments and ask, answer the question on Xinjiang. Um, the first uh, observation that uh, Roger offered about China not being unique, I think that's a really interesting point. And, and that was where I uh, spent many uh, lost nights wondering what the title of this book should be. Um, in terms of using, um, you know, is this an imperial? Is, it, is this a new form of empire? Um, a lot of those sort of suggestions are being bounded around. That brings, there's so much uh, intellectual baggage with those types of terms that I think it locks us into pre-existing debates. So I was trying to suggest that, yeah, this is certainly not unique. This is, fam this is quite familiar, but do we need to understand something else here that, um, uh, so we don't just read this through certain uh, familiar kind of um, academic and, and existing debates. Um, and also the competition that's happening in, in Eurasia today. Um, and the second point is that uh, uh, Roger also correctly identified the ways in which um, there's a difference between the, a European and a, an Asian and imaginary of the Silk Road. So one of the things I sort of cover, particularly in the second book on the Silk Road, is the ways in which this gets picked up by Japan in the Cold War and then China since the 1990s, but obviously since the launch of Belt and Road more explicitly, and the ways in which that is an intra-Asian uh, language of connectivity and speaks to the kind of d discourses of pan-Asianism that we saw at the beginning of the 20th century and have emerged at different points through that, through that 20th century period. So there's a question on one of the chat panels about, is this a language, does this connect to shared destiny? So yes, I think so. I think the, the ways in which uh, a number of Chinese ambassadors have been uh, framing Belt and Road is the revival of the Silk Roads, is about the revival of Asia in the 21st century. This speaks to... Uh, episodes of humiliation um, by the West, whether it's Greece, whether it's Italy, whether it's the Arab world um, or, or Iran. Um, and so the Silk Road's office is platform for that type of um, affinity, uh, both for the past and the future. So coming to uh, the question of Xinjiang, I would say um, we would, it's potentially productive to look at the situation of what's happened in Tibet the last uh, decade or so, or last 20 years, I guess. And the ways in which um, uh, the, the, the idea of, of um, uh, celebrating uh, the, the peoples and nations of China and um, within that kind of integration of Tibet into the, into the nation state more explicitly and using discourses of cultural connectivity that are also about containment and obviously that then lead to forms of migration and investment and development within the region. So I'm thinking of sort of, you know, obviously Jim Scott's work of seeing like a state in that regard. But also heritage plays a particular role in that regard, which I think we're also going to be seeing in Xinjiang in the ways that it's also about celebrating diversity to destroy difference. And that's a form of cultural and social governance that works in that way. So that's the domestic dimensions of that. And then I think internationally, which is um, uh, uh, what we've also been talking about of how that will play out. I think in the COVID, post-COVID uh, world, we're also going to see that increasingly so the case that China is driving a, a form of cultural internationalism through um, different forms of cooperation across multiple sectors. And I, I, I think of that in a much more broad and expansive way of, of internationalism that sort of uh, emerged in the late 19th century. Um, 
that crosses multiple sectors, health, education, science, uh, culture, etc. Um, but I think uh, the question of the ways in which other countries in the region will be uh, tolerant and responsive to what's happening in Xinjiang will be something to watch. And I think yeah, increasingly so that um, uh, there'll be a lack of willingness, lack of uh, appetite to sort of tolerate what's happening. And, uh, and that China will probably have to respond accordingly. But, you know, let's see. That's, uh, that's one of those uh, unpredictables that I think will be an important thing to watch. But I think, therefore, the Silk Road plays an important role in, in how China will make those types of calculations. It's more than just a geopolitical question. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. I mean, just maybe uh, uh, move, move, uh, uh, going on on the domestic dimension of uh, Chinese foreign policy. I mean, when we talk about uh, or analyze uh, Chinese foreign policy as a backward initiative, we usually refer to uh, the narrative of the Chinese political authorities or of, uh, to the narrative of foreign countries' governments or foreign countries' populations. But we know much less about how Chinese people view their government's foreign policy. Uh, I mean, uh, I mentioned that because we know that one of the goals of the Chinese government is to materialize the China dreams. I mean, not only beyond its borders, but also inside the country. Uh, I mean, China uses its foreign policy, and uh, you already mentioned that a little bit, but uh, China uses its foreign policy, and especially the BRI, as a tool to build or uh, strengthen uh, its political legitimacy inside the country, for example, by presenting it as a step towards uh, how to say it, the recovered pride of the nation after the end of the historical Silk Roads, and also after what has been called in China the century of humiliations, which go from uh, the first Opium Wars to the end of the Japanese uh, Sino Japanese Sino War in 1945. So, my question is to what extent uh, the strategy, the Chinese government strategy to use foreign policy as a tool. Uh, of uh, political legitimacy works, or to what extent are the backward initiative and Chinese foreign policy supported by the Chinese people? What do we know actually about that? Shall I dive into that one? Any of you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, again, I'll say that's uh, one of the themes I've really sort of tried to talk about in the book. Um, uh, whether it's clear, I don't know, I'm not so sure, but that, because it is, it is a complicated topic. I, I think one of the interesting things about the Silk Road in, in, in the ways in which that, um, that, that narrative of the futures about reworking the past, and, and Roger said it, that history is very much about the present more than it is about the past, and the ways in which the two fold into each other, that the interesting addition of the maritime Silk Road is that, is that it's not China as the end of the Silk Road, it now really becomes a centre. Of, of historical connectivity. So it restores, it's that narrative of restoring the Middle Kingdom and China's place to its rightful place in history. Um, and that, um, that uh, and it kind of pulls that Eurasianism away from a kind of Russian imaginary of Eurasianism towards a kind of Chinese and a Sinosphere um, of that. Um, and obviously that's, uh, and, and Russia's responding in that in that regard. But I think, yeah, so, so that, that ways in which it's um, and this is again I think what you see um, in in European kind of uh, uh, 19th century ambitions for expansionism of, the, of European powers that uh, there, there is that project of legitimacy at home and I think that's what we are seeing today in uh, in China domestically. Daniel, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I would. I would just, uh, you know, so many, so many different things coming to mind in terms of uh, both Tim's presentation and, and your question, having to do with the the conscious or somewhat less conscious construction of narratives uh, that states undertake, either uh, intentionally to justify their policies, in, in other words, to to, in a crude sense, to to sort of make them acceptable both to their publics and to international audiences by framing them in ways that are likely to have uh, uh, you know, a cultural resonance or a, a, a touchstones in history and so on. How much of that is motivated and how much of that seems to emerge more organically uh, in the minds of individuals as they undertake projects? And you know, one of the things actually in, in the spirit of having this be a conversation, going back to Tim, I'd be curious, you know, your, your case, your European case in the, 
in terms of uh, excavations and antiquity hunting uh, in, a, in the uh, Middle East, um, Palestine area. I wonder how much of that was driven by kind of state actors uh, as compared to what we're seeing out of the China case, which, you know, quite frankly, I'm, I see a lot of clearly motivated myth building by a powerful totalitarian, illiberal, autocratic regime that is engaged very clearly in the repression of alternative narratives, say the democracy promotion uh, narrative and liberal individual rights, uh, and also a globalized narrative, which includes very much, say, the United States in Asia, as well as European states in Asia, uh, and trying to trade that for a narrative that uh, harkens back to an imagined history, whether maritime or, or uh, land-based silk roads, uh, one that is uh, a very Asian-centric uh, approach, which accords with China's own expectations for uh, Asia for Asians. And is, so it clearly has political designs there. Um, and I'm reminded quickly of a, of a trip I took to in China, in uh, Ningxia province, uh, Yinchuan, where there's a, a place that's described, I, I wrote it down as a, um, let's see, it's the China Hui Culture Park, uh, which is a, a clearly a fabrication, almost like a Disney world of a, of a Muslim, uh, of a mosque and, and other uh, areas that's all newly constructed, uh, intended to create a narrative of um, happy integrated Muslims uh, and interconnectivity between China and the Muslim world. Um, and when I was there was completely empty of tourists uh, and was clearly not, uh, as far as I could tell, actually advancing this narrative very effectively, but it was a state funded, state driven enterprise intended, I think, to, to shape narratives both at home for Chinese visitors and potentially for Muslim visitors who were they, they were hoping to draw uh, from the Arab Middle East. So anyway, I'd be, I'd be curious how Tim would respond to that. Thank you very much, Daniel. Rogers, I mean, if you want, Roger, if you want to add anything, please uh, feel free to jump in the conversation at any time. I don't know if you want to add anything right now. I mean, I would just throw in the, the when we think about the, the evolving Chinese narrative internally, um, there is the political dynamic, but there's also a capacity component, right? If, if you think about the, the, the idea today of China dominating islands in the, in the South China Sea, that was a 1990s thing, but they didn't have the capacity to follow, finish following through and they left them and they pulled back internally and, the, and they looked internally. Now they have the capacity to, to move out. When we see them uh, you know, at, at different moments in, in even in modern history, they, they reach certain limits if their capacity is not strong enough to continue out, then often the, 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 the political drive doesn't overpower the, the core realities of, of capability. But as the capacity builds, they start having that, that, that move out. And I think in, in the perception inside China, just from my own anecdotal experiences, um, prior to about 2007, um, there was one general perception of being a, you know, being a foreigner visiting China and, and the way you were seen. And then that started to evolve very rapidly in the lead up to the Olympics in the perception that the, you know, the West's assault on the Olympic torch runs and, and in rebuilding this, this internal sense of, of Chinese nationalism. What I would argue Xi Jinping has done is taken that, that sense of Chinese nationalism and turned it into, really grasped it into the the, the cultural and, and long history nationalism rather than the communist party nationalism, the, the, the short period of China. And he's really tied to pull, pull that into that much longer narrative. Um, and that way, even if you're, you're not necessarily just saying this is all about being a good communist, this is about being Chinese and China has the long history. And I know in the West, we like to overplay the century of humiliation as the number one driver of all Chinese action. It does resonate, but, but I think there's also, again, we have to come back to not just ideology, but capacity components in assessing what the Chinese are willing to do, what they can do, and how far they reach.
Thank you, thank you so much, Roger. So we have some questions on uh, methodology, actually. Uh, one is a specific for Tim, which is what is the actual role of Asian history in the construction of the analysis in your book? I mean, from your presentation, we heard a lot of parallels with European history and the use of several European imperial concepts. So the question is, how do you tackle uh, the Eurocentric nature of such concepts in your book? And another question, which is addressed to the both of you, is uh, is a pan-continental approach useful to understand uh, Chinese behavior when China behaves so differently in different regions and countries uh, inside this region? So how does uh, this match with the need to focus on Central Asia agency? OK, I'll, I'll dive in again, shall I? Um, uh, I'm just that, that's a really interesting question for me and um, but just before I answer that, I'll just respond quickly to Daniel's point which is a really important one and I think um, that it the degree to which um, this idea of these narratives were um, strategically intended in the first place is that in terms of when Belt and Road was launched and this revival of the Silk Roads I think that's I would imagine that's been a totally unexpected um, momentum that's gathered around this uh, this use of this history um, in the ways in which uh, it, it became normalized by National Geographic or or a whole series of publishers and, and um, both in Asia, China and in, in the United States and in Europe. And, and these are sort of things I've sort of put up on the website um, that a whole series of, of media projects have come alongside and with been an massive proliferation of interest in Silk Road histories. UNESCO has just launched its second phase of its multilateral uh, decade-long project on, on looking at Silk Road connectivities for the 21st century, which speaks to now public health, education, so on and so forth. So I think it's proliferating, proliferating in unexpected ways, primarily because of um, the, the, uh, the benign nature of the Silk Road and as a concept of, of antiquity and connectivity um, and, and Eurasian history. So uh, the question was about, does this speak to histories of Asian history? And I think one of the things I didn't mention in my presentation was that what this, what we're seeing today with China being the author of the Silk Roads in the 21st century is this, this really opens up possibilities. And I think it's happening in a quite tangible way of rewriting world history. So for example, in, in many, um, go to European university and you take a course on world history and you might really only begin to learn about the Indian Ocean once the um, Europeans enter in, in, in 1500. Whereas what we're now seeing is a whole, uh, visibility being given to sort of pre-European uh, connectivities across uh, the Indian Ocean, across Central Asia. It brings Central Asia into world history in a way that a lot of um, uh, courses and publications don't give due recognition to. But of course, what the danger then is, that this also becomes a Sinocentric narrative of, of connectivity and, uh, and Eurasian um, uh, pre-modern pasts. So I think it's there's all sorts of possibilities and, and, and the ways in which that enters cultural policy and media projects. But there's obviously the, the, those sort of new dangers that um, speak to the ways in which um, the question asked about, you know, European concept, Eurocentric concepts of history and historical narratives and how they play out and, and the way they gain political legitimacy. Daniel, Daniel thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I can I can pick up on the second one about why why to try or why to attempt a pan continental sweep in a in a project like this as compared to a, a more focused finely grained uh, single case. Look, I think I think both have utility. Uh, what I tried to do was actually bridge the gap in my own book, um, you know, by focusing on three specific countries at greater length again, Pakistan, Kazakhstan, and Iran, I attempted to really peel away what's happening within those countries in their political economic relations with China and how they, their leaders, their people, to some extent, perceive China's increasingly dense web of connections with their societies and what they want to do about it. So there's a degree of local that I really wanted to get to, uh, which I stress in the book, and with which I think any, any scholar of, of trying to understand what China is doing in the world needs to get down to that, that local level to appreciate what's really happening. But at the same time, um, maybe perhaps for an American audience, especially, 
I wanted to reorient or think more comprehensively about what is happening to China's West. Because as I think maybe Roger pointed out, uh, in the United States, we do have a, a very significant tendency to focus in our competition with China in the Indo-Pacific or what's increasingly called the Indo-Pacific, but the maritime space. Southeast Asia being a principal focal point for that uh, geopolitical competition between the United States and China and getting the lion's share of attention. Issues uh, from the Taiwan Strait uh, to the South China Sea and East China Sea up to North Korea and so on. That's where we see a lot of the literature already on the US-China global competition. And where it's less clear is uh, this other area, this vast territory, the heartland, so to speak, in McKinder's terms, of uh, continental Eurasia. So I really wanted to try to be able to tell a broader story there as well, sort of have my cake and eat it too, do both. Um, and to some extent, that means making trade-offs, uh, which means uh, you know less time on Pakistan. But I felt that by comparing the case of Pakistan to say the case of Kazakhstan and Iran, I would begin to see some of the similarities because it's not just differences. We are seeing common Chinese tools being tried out in one place, say the use of social media, and then replicated elsewhere. Uh, just as a, as a quick example, wolf warrior diplomacy and the hard edged uh, kind of mean and belligerent tone, nationalistic tone pushed back by uh, Chinese diplomats debuted in Pakistan and has now gone global. And I think we can see examples of that type of uh, diplomatic, economic, and even military toolkit from one place to another. And we don't want to overlook those things. Thank you. Uh, an important dimension of China's policy abroad uh, is uh, its uh, soft power policy. I mean, we know that reactions to the Chinese presence on, the, on a global scale are often mixed. I mean, this goes from extremely positive opinion, as China can be, for example, an important factor in economic development, able to stimulate employment or improving uh, the local standard of living. At the same time, uh, China's impact is often criticized and Beijing has reacted to that by so promoting, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a policy of soft power. Uh, in the case of Central Asia, I mean, it's difficult to assess its impact because there are a few studies, but this policy so far seems to have had limited impact if we consider the surveys which were conducted, for example, in Kazakhstan or Kyrgyzstan. So could you elaborate a little bit on China's foreign policy in soft power, uh, its goals, successes, its failures, uh, uh, its impact, I mean, in Central Asia, but also abroad? Uh, beyond, sorry, beyond Central Asia, in Eurasia and in the uh, uh, ge geographical spaces that you address in your books. Yeah, I can, I can jump in first. And I know Tim uh, has, has uh, some views about soft power, I think. Uh, so, and, and it's, it's a meaning, but I, I will say, I agree with you, Sebastian, the, the, the story so far is mixed. It's clear that China doesn't just waltz in uh, buy up a couple of radio stations and, and uh, extend its TV programming, uh, declare that it's going to build some hospital, hospitals and roads, and all of a sudden is greeted with love and affection by local populations. To the contrary, there's a lot of skepticism and wariness in many of these states, and particularly, you know better than I do, in Kazakhstan, uh, kind of a latent and underlying and even reinforced, I think, sense of, of uh, concern about China and about what China may bring. Uh, and the threat that it may pose, particularly if it undertakes more contentious issue, uh, politics and uh, economic agendas like uh, buying land uh, or even long leases of land. And this is true in Pakistan as well, where land holding is a particularly sensitive political and economic social issue and where China is associated with efforts even to corporatize or to reform and make more efficient uh, agricultural processes in places like Pakistan, uh, that can come with an immediate political backlash. So uh, broadly speaking, though, I, I would point to one thing that unifies many of these states on, one, on China's Western horizon. That is, they are not liberal, and their people are not allowed to uh, publicly uh, declare their frustrations with China, 
uh, their leaders uh, hold uh, increasingly, I think in almost all the cases I've looked at, <laughs> increasingly repressive positions uh, and can contain control and redirect uh, to a greater or lesser extent public opinion. And on China, that happens routinely. And so uh, as mentioned earlier, the, the brewing and I think likely to continue growing public distrust of China based on its policies in Xinjiang and toward ethnic uh, Uyghurs and Kazakhs. Um, this is unpopular publicly, we have to think. And yet because the publics are not able to voice their sentiments publicly uh, or are sometimes repressed when they attempt to do so, some of the anger that is likely to boil over on these issues will not necessarily first be addressed toward China, but will instead first be addressed toward their own autocratic regimes. That is, China's behavior in Xinjiang may have the indirect consequence of creating new fissures and cleavages within these societies. That is, publics versus their leaders, their leaders who look to be too much in bed with the Chinese, too willing to overlook Chinese uh, genocidal behavior, too, weather, too willing to silence people who are critical of China. And that creates uh, the potential for uh, new cleavages within these societies. Jim, do so, you want to, sorry, go ahead. Yes, no, I, I think that's an interesting question. And and um, and uh, I, I mean, I agree with Daniel, some of his sentiments that um, you really have to sort of look at the um, and I think Roger said it as well, the, the, the ways in which this is such an uneven landscape. And if, if I would be uh, misrepresenting myself or, or suggesting that, um, that all of these projects are successful, many are not, and many of them do stumble and they fail and they have unintended consequences. So, so that's um, why it's always interesting to do as a, as a life as a researcher to, to kind of study these things. But um, I think in terms of Central Asia, uh, I would answer that question in limited time in, in back, to pull it back to the issue of the how the Silk Road is being deployed um, for um, forms of cooperation, but also forms of infrastructure development around tourism, et cetera. Um, that's, uh, for Central Asia, that's obviously a history that it feels some sense of ownership over. So I think if, if China co-opts that and, and tries to instrumentalize that history and writes it and narrates it and frames it and then and promotes that as a, as a China driven story and a China-centric story, then I think that's going to backfire and will be counterproductive. And that's the kind of dialogues I've been having with uh, scholars in Central Asia, so uh, um, reminding me of that as well. But also um, uh, the ways in which the Silk Road is a story that glosses over the complexities of these historical connectivities and, 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 the, and the, the ways in which they speak to formations of political entities in the 19th and 20th century. So again, if this is a sort of mobilization of culture and that, that tries to deny any of these complexities, I think also that can be counterproductive. And I think that will be um, a, a form of pushback um, by uh, both scholars, media projects, et cetera, in, 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 in the region, I think will be increasingly um, dissatisfied with that approach to understanding these cultural connectivities. If I could throw in just a, a real sure, quick sure. tactical component of response to this, when we think about soft power and the response to criticism, one place to look though is that the Chinese have learned. And, and if you think in mm. discrete tactical soft power, not necessarily in the grand narrative. So we, we saw this first in Africa and we've seen it in other places where the Chinese had the criticism of only bringing in Chinese workers, Absolutely. not doing anything. And now they've adapted, particularly at the state level SOEs, not necessarily the provincial level or local level, but the state level SOEs have learned to adapt to do things like use local workers, build a hospital, build a school, mm -hmm. do that type to manage the, the soft power, if we want to call it that, at the local level. That, that changes the dynamic. And there's been some interesting studies I was looking at recently on, for example, perception of the value you know, of China as good or bad based on closeness to projects that have a direct impact on the individuals. Um, so I think that we can't underestimate that, that well, the, mm. the big narrative might be clunky. Um, mm. At the tactical level in certain geographies, the Chinese are very effective and they've learned by watching Westerners and they learned at their own failures. Um, and where we see the most problems probably is where you see the provincial or local level SOEs go out and try to run on the coattails of, this, of the national level SOEs who are much more um, aware of these things and those smaller level SOEs are not. 
Thank you. Uh, I mean, in the last minutes we have for this seminar, I would like to bring in the triangular dimension of the topic, meaning Central Asia, China, and uh, the United States. Uh, if we consider, for example, the case of Central Asia, the, uh, the question would be what role or what kind of place could uh, the US find uh, facing China's presence, facing China increasing its presence in the region? I mean, it's not, we all know that uh, it's not easy enough for any country, including Russia, to compete with China's influence, at least with China's economic influence. So uh, if we look at what the US is doing, it's trade with the region, with Central Asia, which is very limited. Uh, uh, some surveys show that the US, uh, some surveys show that, oh, sorry, the US is not very popular among Central Asian population, and it's less popular than China and much, much less than Russia. So, and the US has tried actually to strengthen its presence in the region. It has tried to launch, as we all know, I mean, its new uh, Silk Road initiative, which aim at improving the connections between China, uh, between Central Asia and South Asia. But actually very few has been done for uh, plenty of reasons, for security reasons in Afghanistan, but also because uh, this kind of project requires uh, significant uh, uh, investments. We're talking here of course, about tens of billions of dollars, and that would be very difficult uh, for the US to bring this kind of investments, whereas China has been able to invest billions of dollars in its BRI. So what should be the priorities for the US uh, in the region and how to reach them? And do you consider that the US strategy conducted in Central Asia and beyond is relevant? Or what would you recommend, how would you recommend uh, what, uh, to, to, to improve that? And a question actually related to that uh, asked by the audience too is one of the downsides of the BRI has been the debt traps uh, to this nation. So can actually the United States uh, propose a better solution for, uh, for these nations? Uh, I can uh, take this one. Um, look, I, I think one of the things that I, I come out after writing this book believing more firmly than, than maybe I did before is that it is not smart for the United States to take uh, what I saw increasingly, certainly in parts of the Trump administration, uh, and we may continue to see, uh, to not attempt to ape or mimic uh, or compete on the same terms as the Chinese do when it comes particularly to China's focus on Belt and Road infrastructure investment uh, the United States is not, as I think, Sebastian, as you were pointing to, we are not well positioned to do these types of projects, particularly not well positioned to do them in far flung places in the world uh, where we don't enjoy some other uh, kind of immediate advantage of proximity or, or other connections. Um, we look bad when we attempt uh, to mimic what the Chinese are doing at much lower dollar figures uh, and with not terribly uh, rapid success. And that's what I've seen in a number of instances. Now, where we can begin to uh, square that circle on a strictly competition over infrastructure related to BRI is when we partner with other countries who are more engaged in these areas like Japan, and where we focus on issues of higher quality infrastructure, of environmental concerns, of labor concerns, of doing, of building things effectively and in the right way in a sustainable way and putting a stamp of approval on that. So the, where the Trump administration did uh, work with Australia in particular and others on developing a so-called blue dot network, uh, which would certify the relative quality of different infrastructure projects. That's the type of thing that I would hope we would continue with. It didn't get very far. And I think there's a lot of work that could be done uh, to advance that type of agenda. Instead, where we should be focusing on areas are on areas of America's relative advantage. We are very good in education. We are very good in attracting brilliant minds to come and study and work in the United States. Our doors should be open to such people and should be more open to them. These opportunities create connections and a sense of the United States that is much different from the United States, from, from China. Uh, and also different from the United States as it's presented itself of late, particularly in Central Asia, but elsewhere as well. Uh, we do have uh, opportunities for science and technology promotion. I remember a group of Kazakhstani um, uh, 
academics coming to Washington DC and what did they want to talk about? Access to libraries, digital libraries and resources. How could the United States do more of that? We have an incentive and an inbuilt advantage to promoting access to information and to ideas and to free thinking that fundamentally separates us from China and will forever separate us from China, at least as long as China is ruled uh, by the Communist Party. That is where we should press an advantage in terms of our relations. Um, much of that can be done even at distance. Um, but to be clear, it for much of Central Asia, that will place us at the margins geopolitically, still not competing uh, in, a, in a deep sense with China or Russia. Uh, that will still put us at, at a bit of a remove. And the practical reality is given the limits of our resources and the distance that we're talking about, um, that's the reality that I think we face. We are not a continental Eurasian power. I don't think we ever will be. Uh, we, need to, we need to recognize that reality. Thank you, Daniel. Tim, any comments? I, I feel nervous speaking about what the US should say, um, sitting in Australia, which is um, uh, increasingly um, making a mess of its uh, international relations in all sorts of ways. But anyway, um, uh, I would say, I would say, I'd say, I think a starting point, all I would say is that I think a starting point is understanding how South to South cooperation is changing the game in so many ways. I think that's a fascinating set of developments, which um, both Europe and the US is, is yet to really understand what's happening there. And I think, um, so I think some sort of uh, um, mapping in, um, I mean that in a kind of, in its broader sense of understanding how that's shifting. And so it's not just um, uh, China in the region, it's where India is going in the region. Um, and it's how it sees its place within its, creating its spheres and its zones of influence, but also the Arab world and Iran, et cetera. Um, and obviously some of, you know, the, 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 Turkey's role in West Asia and how that's a kind of complex um, space of collaboration and competition. Um, that it's not China definitely is not um, the sole player in this space, and it's it's the one that's pushing um, international structures most directly. But I think there's other re other countries re responding fast. So where the US sits within that changing landscape is quite a complicated one. And I think it's and I'm, I, I, when I say that I'm also thinking of what Daniel's been saying around the ways in which. Um, uh, we, we, Belt and Road has primarily been understood in academia as physical infrastructure, but there is so many dimensions to it in terms of education, public health, city to city connections, um, digital connections, which I think I think the digital is the real game changer in all sorts of ways. And, um, and we're yet to really understand how that's happening. Um, and, and so I think, you know, that's uh, understanding where that's going in the future is, is an important uh, pathway for the US as well. Thank you, Tim. Unfortunately, we're running out of time, but Roger, would you like to say a final word, a final comments? Final comment? Boy, that's a lot of pressure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I mean, I think that what, what's come across to me, um, both in answer to this final question that we have and, and across the board, is that it's imperative that as we look at this space, we understand the complexity, that you have to simultaneously look at that high level overarching theme to be able to grasp it, but then you have to be willing to constantly go down in and drill into the localized complexities uh, uh, of the area to really understand what you do. And in the end, if the United States feels compelled to do something, it needs to first and foremost define uh, its imperatives. It needs to define what the ends are before it goes in and just does things because it's always done things or because it's just acting in a reactive manner. And knowing those details is going to help with that. All right. Thank you so, so much, Roger. And very unfortunately, we are running out of time. We're late, so we uh, need to finish this event. Uh, this conversation could have gone on for a long time, I guess. It's such a very uh, rich, rich topic. <laughs> Uh, I would like to thank so Tim, Daniel for their great presentation, for having accepted to be with us and present their book today. I would also like to thank Roger Lott, who had a very short time to read uh, two books, but I think he had a very good time actually because these are, these are really uh, two excellent books. I really recommend all of you uh, to, to read them. Uh, 
Uh, I would like to thank the George H. W. Bush Foundation for U.S.-China Relations, uh, who uh, co-organized this event uh, with us today. I mean, uh, I would like to thank David uh, Firestein, who is the president of the foundation, who we were trying with the chief program officer and chief of staff of the foundation. And I would like to thank especially Zoe Ulan, who is uh, the director of Track to Diplomacy Program at the foundation, and who worked with us today to, I mean, before to organize uh, this event. And of course, I thank you to all of you who attended uh, this event today, and we look forward to having you in another uh, seminar. Thank you. So have a good day. And for those of you who are far from the United States, like Tim, who are in Australia, have a good night. Thank you very much. Goodbye.